Leviathan, were the matter, for me and power of a commonwealth, ecclesiastical and civil. Book by Thomas Hobbes. Narrated by Andrew. Originally published in 1651. This is a great audiobook production, created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 26. Of Civil Laws. Civil Law What? By civil laws, I understand the laws that men are therefore bound to observe, because they are members not of this, or that commonwealth in particular, but of a commonwealth. For the knowledge of particular laws belongeth to them, that profess the study of the laws of their several countries, but the knowledge of civil law in general, to any man. The Antient Law of Rome was called their civil law, from the word civitus, which signifies a commonwealth. And those countries, which having been under the Roman Empire, and governed by that law, retain still such part thereof as they think fit, call that part the civil law, to distinguish it from the rest of their own civil laws. But that is not it I intend to speak of here, my design being not to shew what is law here, and there, but what is law. As Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, and divers others have done, without taking upon them the profession of the study of the law. And first it manifests that law in general is not counsel, but command, nor a command of any man to any man, but only of him, whose command is addressed to one formerly obliged to obey him. And as for civil law, it addeth only the name of the person commanding, which is persona civitatis, the person of the commonwealth. Which considered, I define civil law in this manner. Civil law is to every subject, those rules, which the commonwealth hath commanded him, by word, writing, or other sufficient sign of the will, to make use of, for the distinction of right and wrong, that is to say, of what is contrary, and what is not contrary to the rule, in which definition there is nothing that is not at first sight evident. For every man seeth that some laws are addressed to all the subjects in general, some to particular provinces, some to particular vocations, and some to particular men. And are therefore laws, to every of those to whom the command is directed, and to none else. As also, that laws are the rules of just and unjust, nothing being reputed unjust that is not contrary to some law. Likewise, that none can make laws but the commonwealth, because our subjection is to the commonwealth only, and that commands are to be signified by sufficient signs. Because a man knows not otherwise how to obey them. And therefore, whatsoever can from this definition by necessary consequence be deduced, ought to be acknowledged for truth. Now I deduce from it this that followeth. The sovereign is legislator. 1. The legislator in all commonwealths is only the sovereign, be he one man, as in a monarchy, or one assembly of men, as in a democracy, or aristocracy. For the legislator is he that mocketh the law. And the commonwealth only prescribes in common death the observation of those rules, which we call law. Therefore the commonwealth is the legislator. But the commonwealth is no person, nor has capacity to do anything, but by the representative, that is, the sovereign winky face and therefore the sovereign is the sole legislator. For the same reason, none can abrogate a law made, but the sovereign, because a law is not abrogated, but by another law that forbiddeth it to be put in execution, and not subject to civil law. 2. The sovereign of a commonwealth, be it an assembly, or one man, is not subject to the civil laws. For having power to make and repeal laws, he may when he pleaseth free himself from that subjection by repealing those laws that trouble him and making of new. And consequently he was free before. For he is free that can be free when he will, nor is it possible for any person to be bound to himself, because he that can bind can release. And therefore he that is bound to himself onely is not bound. Use a law not by virtue of time but of the sovereign's consent. 3. When long use obtaineth the authority of a law, it is not the length of time that mocketh the authority, but the will of the sovereign signified by a silence. For silence is sometimes an argument of consent winky face, and it is no longer law, then the sovereign shall be silent therein. And therefore if the sovereign shall have a question of right grounded, not upon his present will, but upon the laws formerly made, the length of time shall bring no prejudice to his right but the question shall be judged by equity. For many unjust actions and unjust sentences go uncontrolled a longer time than any man can remember. And our lawyers account no custom's law, 
but such as are reasonable, and that evil customs are to be abolished. But the judgment of what is reasonable, and of what is to be abolished, belongeth to him that mocketh the law, which is the sovereign assembly, or monarch. The law of nature and the civil law contain each other. For the law of nature and the civil law contain each other, and are of equal extent. For the laws of nature, which consist in equity, justice, gratitude, and other moral virtues on these depending. In the condition of mere nature, as I have said before in the end of the fifteenth chapter, are not properly laws, but qualities that dispose men to peace, and to obedience. When a commonwealth is once settled, then are they actually laws, and not before, as being then the commands of the commonwealth. And therefore also civil laws, for it is the sovereign power that obliges men to obey them. For in the differences of private men, to declare, what is equity, what is justice, and what is moral virtue, and to make them binding, there is need of the ordinances of sovereign power. And punishments to be ordained for such as shall break them, which ordinances are therefore part of the civil law. The law of nature therefore is a part of the civil law in all commonwealths of the world. Reciprocally also, the civil law is a part of the dictates of nature. For justice, that is to say, performance of covenant, and giving to every man his own, is a dictate of the law of nature. But every subject in a commonwealth hath covenanted to obey the civil law, either one with another, as when they assemble to make a common representative. Or with the representative itself one by one, when subdued by the sword they promise obedience, that they may receive life. And therefore obedience to the civil law is part also of the law of nature. Civil and natural law are not different kinds, but different parts of law, whereof one part being written is called civil, the other unwritten, natural. But the right of nature, that is, the natural liberty of man, may by the civil law be abridged and restrained. Nay, the end of making laws is no other but such restraint, without the which there cannot possibly be any peace. And law is brought into the world for nothing else, but to limit the natural liberty of particular men, in such manner, as they might not hurt, but assist one another, and join together against a common enemy. Provincial laws are not made by custom, but by the sovereign power. 5. If the sovereign of one commonwealth subdue a people that have lived under other written laws, and afterwards govern them by the same laws, by which they were governed before. Yet those laws are the civil laws of the victor, and not of the vanquished commonwealth, for the legislator is he, not by whose authority the laws were first made, but by whose authority they now continue to be laws. And therefore where there be diverse provinces, within the dominion of a commonwealth, and in those provinces diversity of laws, which commonly are called the customs of each several province. We are not to understand that such customs have their force only from length of time, but that they were anniently laws written or otherwise made known for the constitutions and statutes of their sovereigns, and are now laws not by virtue of the prescription of time, but by the constitutions of their present sovereigns. But if an unwritten law in all the provinces of a dominion shall be generally observed, and no iniquity appear in the use thereof, that law can be no other but a law of nature equally obliging all mankind. Some foolish opinions of lawyers concerning the making of laws. 6. Seeing that all laws, written and unwritten, have their authority and force from the will of the commonwealth, that is to say, from the will of the representative, which in a monarchy is the monarch, and in other commonwealths the sovereign assembly. A man may wonder from whence proceed such opinions, as are found in the books of lawyers of eminence in several commonwealths, directly, or by consequence making the legislative power depend on private men or subordinate judges. As for example, that the common law hath no controller but the parliament, which is true only where a parliament has the sovereign power and cannot be assembled nor dissolved, but by their own discretion. For if there be a right in any else to dissolve them, there is a right also to control them and consequently to control their controllings. And if there be no such right, then the controller of laws is not parliamentum, but rex in parlamento. And where a parliament is sovereign, if it should assemble never so many, or so wise men, from the country subject to them, for whatsoever cause. Yet there is no man will believe, that such an assembly hath thereby acquired to themselves a legislative power. Item, that the two arms of a commonwealth, are force and justice, 
the first whereof is in the king, the other deposited in the hands of the parliament. As if a commonwealth could consist, where the force were in any hand, which justice had not the authority to command and govern. 7. That law can never be against reason, our lawyers are agreed. And that not the letter, that is, every construction of it, but that which is according to the intention of the legislator, is the law. And it is true, but the doubt is, of whose reason it is, that shall be received for law. It is not meant of any private reason, for then there would be as much contradiction in the laws, as there is in the schools. Nor yet, as senior ed, Coke makes it, Sir Edward Coke, upon Littleton Lib 2. CH 6 fall 97. B, comma, an artificial perfection of reason, gotten by long study, observation, and experience, as his was. For it is possible long study may increase, and confirm erroneous sentences. And where men build on false grounds, the more they build, the greater is the ruin. And of those that study, and observe with equal time, and diligence, the reasons and resolutions are, and must remain discordant. And therefore it is not that jurisprudentia, or wisdom of subordinate judges. But the reason of this are artificial man the commonwealth, and his command, that mocketh law. And the commonwealth being in their representative but one person, there cannot easily arise any contradiction in the laws. And when there doth, the same reason is able, by interpretation, or alteration, to take it away. In all courts of justice, the sovereign, which is the person of the commonwealth, is he that judgeth. The subordinate judge ought to have regard to the reason which moved his sovereign to make such law, that his sentence may be according thereunto, which then is his sovereign sentence. Otherwise it is his own, and an unjust one. Law made, if not also made known, is no law. 8. From this, that the law is a command, and a command consisteth in declaration, or manifestation of the will of him that common death, by voice, writing, or some other sufficient argument of the same, we may understand, that the command of the commonwealth, is law only to those, that have means to take notice of it. Over natural fools, children, or madmen there is no law, no more than over brute beasts, nor are they capable of the title of just, or unjust. Because they had never power to make any covenant, or to understand the consequences thereof. And consequently never took upon them to authorize the actions of any sovereign, as they must do that make to themselves a commonwealth. So also every man, from whom any accident, not proceeding from his own default, hath taken away the means to take notice of any particular law, is excused, if he observe it not. And to speak properly, that law is no law to him. It is therefore necessary, to consider in this place, what arguments, and signas be sufficient for the knowledge of what is the law. That is to say, what is the will of the sovereign, as well in monarchies, as in other forms of government. Unwritten laws are all of them laws of nature. And first, if it be a law that obliges all the subjects without exception, and is not written, nor otherwise published in such places as they may take notice thereof, it is a law of nature. For whatsoever men are to take knowledge of for law, not upon other men's words, but every one from his own reason, must be such as is agreeable to the reason of all men. Which no law can be, but the law of nature. The laws of nature therefore need not any publishing, nor proclamation. As being contained in this one sentence, approved by all the world, do not that to another, which thou thinkest unreasonable to be done by another to thyself. Secondly, if it be a law that obliges only some condition of men, or one particular man, and be not written, nor published by word, then also it is a law of nature. And known by the same arguments and signs, that distinguish those in such a condition from other subjects. For whatsoever law is not written, or some way published by him that makes it law, can be known no way, but by the reason of him that is to obey it. And is therefore also a law not only civil, but natural. For example, if the sovereign employ a public minister, without written instructions what to do, he is obliged to take for instructions the dictates of reason. As if he make a judge, the judge is to take notice, that his sentence ought to be according to the reason of his sovereign, which being always understood to be equity. He is bound to it by the law of nature. Or if an ambassador, he is, in all things not contained in his written instructions, 
to take for instruction that which reason dictates to be most conducing to his sovereign's interest. And so of all other ministers of the sovereignty, public and private, all which instructions of natural reason may be comprehended under one name of fidelity, which is a branch of natural justice. The law of nature accepted, it belongeth to the essence of all other laws, to be made known, to every man that shall be obliged to obey them, either by word, or writing, or some other act. Known to proceed from the sovereign authority. For the will of another cannot be understood, but by his own word, or act, or by conjecture taken from his scope and purpose. Which in the person of the commonwealth is to be supposed always consonant to equity and reason. And in antite time, before letters were in common use, the laws were many times put into verse. That the rude people taking pleasure in singing or reciting them might the more easily retain them in memory. And for the same reason Solomon adviseth a man to bind the Ten Commandments prof. 7. 3. Upon his ten fingers. And for the law which Moses gave to the people of Israel at the renewing of the covenant, D.U.T. 11. 19. He biddeth them to teach it their children by discoursing of it both at home, and upon the way, at going to bed, and at rising from bed, and to ride it upon the posts and doors of their houses. In Deuteronomy 31, 12, to assemble the people, man, woman, and child, to hear it read. Nothing is law where the legislator cannot be known. Nor is it enough the law be written and published, but also that there be manifest signs that it proceedeth from the will of the sovereign. For private men, when they have, or think they have force enough to secure their unjust designs, and convoy them safely to their ambitious ends, may publish for laws what they please, without, or against the legislative authority. There is therefore requisite, not only a declaration of the law, but also sufficient signs of the author and authority. The author or legislator is supposed in every commonwealth to be evident, because he is the sovereign, who having been constituted by the consent of every one is supposed by everyone to be sufficiently known. And though the ignorance and security of men be such, for the most part, as that when the memory of the first constitution of their commonwealth is worn out, they do not consider. By whose power they used to be defended against their enemies, and to have their industry protected, and to be righted when injury is done them. Yet because no man that considers can make question of it, no excuse can be derived from the ignorance of where the sovereignty is placed. And it is a dictate of natural reason, and consequently an evident law of nature, that no man ought to weaken that power, the protection whereof he hath himself demanded, or wittingly received against others. Therefore of who is sovereign, no man, but by his own fault, whatsoever evil men suggest, can make any doubt. The difficulty consisteth in the evidence of the authority derived from him. The removing whereof, dependeth on the knowledge of the public registers, public councils, public ministers, and public seals, by which all laws are sufficiently verified. Difference between verifying and authorizing. Verified, I say, not authorized, for the verification is but the testimony and record, not the authority of the law, which consisteth in the command of the sovereign only. The law verified by the subordinate judge. If therefore a man have a question of injury, depending on the law of nature, that is to say, on common equity. The sentence of the judge, that by commission hath authority to take cognizance of such causes, is a sufficient verification of the law of nature in that individual case. For though the advice of one that professeth the study of the law be useful for the avoiding of contention, yet it is but advice. Tis the judge must tell men what is law, upon the hearing of the controversy, by the public registers. But when the question is of injury, or crime, upon a written law, Every man by recourse to the registers, by himself, or others, may, if he will, be sufficiently informed, before he does such injury, or commit the crime, whether it be an injury, or not. Nay he ought to do so, for when a man doubts whether the act he goeth about, be just, or unjust, and may inform himself, if he will, the doing is unlawful. In like manner, he that supposeth himself injured, in a case determined by the written law, which he may by himself, or others see and consider. If he complain before he consults with the law, he does unjustly, and bereath a disposition rather to vex other men than to demand his own right, by letters patent and public seal. If the question be of obedience to a public officer, 
to have seen his commission with the public seal and heard it read. Or to have had the means to be informed of it, if a man would, is a sufficient verification of his authority. For every man is obliged to do his best endeavor to inform himself of all written laws that may concern his own future actions. The interpretation of the law dependeth on the sovereign power. The legislator known, and the laws, either by writing or by the light of nature, sufficiently published, there wanteth yet another very material circumstance to make them obligatory. For it is not the letter, but the intendment, or meaning, that is to say, the authentic interpretation of the law, which is the sense of the legislator, in which the nature of the law consisteth. And therefore the interpretation of all laws dependeth on the authority sovereign. And the interpreters can be none but those, which the sovereign, to whom only the subject oweth obedience, shall appoint. For else, by the craft of an interpreter, the law might be made to bear a sense, contrary to that of the sovereign, by which means the interpreter becomes the legislator. All laws need interpretation. All laws, written and unwritten, have need of interpretation. The unwritten law of nature, though it be easy to such, as without partiality and passion, make use of their natural reason, and therefore leaves the violators thereof without excuse. Yet considering there be very few, perhaps none, that in some cases are not blinded by self-love or some other passion, it is now become of all laws the most obscure, and has consequently the greatest need of able interpreters. The written laws, if they be short, are easily misinterpreted from the divers' significations of a word or two. If long, they be more obscure by the diverse significations of many words. In so much as no written law, delivered in few or many words, can be well understood, without a perfect understanding of the final causes, for which the law was made. The knowledge of which final causes is in the legislator. To him therefore there cannot be any knot in the law, insoluble, either by finding out the ends, to undo it by. Or else by making what ends he will, as Alexander did with his sword in the Gordian knot, by the legislative power, which no other interpreter can do. The authentical interpretation of law is not that of writers. The interpretation of the laws of nature in a commonwealth dependeth not on the books of moral philosophy. The authority of writers, without the authority of the commonwealth, mocketh not their opinions law, be they never so true. That which I have written in this treatise, concerning the moral virtues, and of their necessity, for the procuring and maintaining peace, though it be evident truth, is not therefore presently law, but because in all commonwealths in the world, it is part of the civil law, for though it be naturally reasonable, yet it is by the sovereign power that it is law, otherwise, it were a great error, to call the laws of nature unwritten law. Whereof we see so many volumes published, and in them so many contradictions of one another, and of themselves. The interpreter of the law is the judge giving sentence viva voce in every particular case. The interpretation of the law of nature is the sentence of the judge constituted by the sovereign authority to hear and determine such controversies as depend thereon, and consisteth in the application of the law to the present case. For in the act of judicature, the judge doth no more but consider whether the demand of the party be consonant to natural reason and equity. And the sentence he giveth is therefore the interpretation of the law of nature, which interpretation is authentic, not because it is his private sentence but because he giveth it by authority of the sovereign, whereby it becomes the sovereign sentence, which is law for that time, to the party's pleading. The sentence of a judge does not bind him or another judge to give like sentence in like cases ever after. But because there is no judge subordinate, nor sovereign, but may err in a judgment of equity. If afterward in another like case he find it more consonant to equity to give a contrary sentence, he is obliged to do it. No man's error becomes his own law nor obliges him to persist in it. Neither, for the same reason, becomes it a law to other judges, though sworn to follow it. For though a wrong sentence given by authority of the sovereign, if he know and allow it, and such laws as are mutable, be a constitution of a new law, in cases, in which every little circumstance is the same, yet in laws immutable, such as are the laws of nature, there are no laws to the same, or other judges, in the like cases forever after. Princes succeed one another, and one judge passeth, another cometh, nay, heaven and earth shall passe, but not one title of the law of nature shall passe, 
for it is the eternal law of God. Therefore, all the sentences of precedent judges that have ever been cannot altogether make a law contrary to natural equity. Nor any examples of former judges can warrant an unreasonable sentence or discharge the present judge of the trouble of studying what is equity in the case he is to judge. From the principles of his own natural reason. For example's sake, tis against the law of nature to punish the innocent, and innocent is he that acquitteth himself judicially and is acknowledged for innocent by the judge. Put the case now that a man is accused of a capital crime and seeing the powers and malice of some enemy and the frequent corruption and partiality of judges runneth away for fear of the event and afterwards is taken and brought to a legal trial and mocketh it sufficiently appear he was not guilty of the crime and being thereof acquitted is nevertheless condemned to lose his goods. This is a manifest condemnation of the innocent. I say therefore that there is no place in the world where this can be an interpretation of a law of nature, or be made a law by the sentences of precedent judges that had done the same. For he that judged at first, judged unjustly, and no injustice can be a pattern of judgment to succeeding judges. A written law may forbid innocent men to fly, and they may be punished for flying. But that flying for fear of injury should be taken for presumption of guilt, after a man is already absolved of the crime judicially, is contrary to the nature of a presumption which hath no place after judgment given. Yet this is set down by a great lawyer for the common law of England. If a man, saith he, that is innocent, be accused of felony, and for fear flieth for the same, albeit he judicially acquitteth himself of the felony. Yet if it be found that he fled for the felony, he shall notwithstanding his innocency, forfeit all his goods, chattels, debts, and duties. For as to the forfeiture of them, the law will admit no proof against the presumption in law, grounded upon his flight. Here you see, an innocent man, judicially acquitted. Notwithstanding his innocency, when no written law forbade him to fly, after his acquit all, upon a presumption in law, condemned to lose all the goods he hath. If the law ground upon his flight a presumption of the fact, which was capital, the sentence ought to have been capital. If the presumption were not of the fact, for what then ought he to lose his goods? This therefore is no law of England, nor is the condemnation grounded upon a presumption of law, but upon the presumption of the judges. It is also against law, to say that no proof shall be admitted against a presumption of law. For all judges, sovereign and subordinate, if they refuse to hear proof, refuse to do justice. For though the sentence be just, yet the judges that condemn without hearing the proofs offered, are unjust judges, and their presumption is but prejudice which no man ought to bring with him to the seat of justice, whatsoever precedent judgments or examples he shall pretend to follow. There be other things of this nature, wherein men's judgments have been perverted, by trusting to precedents. But this is enough to shew, that though the sentence of the judge be a law to the party pleading, yet it is no law to any judge that shall succeed him in that office. In like manner, when question is of the meaning of written laws, he is not the interpreter of them, that writeth a commentary upon them. For commentaries are commonly more subject to cavil than the text, and therefore need other commentaries, and so there will be no end of such interpretation. And therefore, unless there be an interpreter authorized by the sovereign, from which the subordinate judges are not to recede, the interpreter can be no other than the ordinary judges. In the some manner, as they are in cases of the unwritten law, and their sentences are to be taken by them that plead for laws in that particular case but not to bind other judges, in like cases to give like judgments. For a judge may err in the interpretation even of written laws, but no error of a subordinate judge can change the law, which is the general sentence of the sovereign. The difference between the letter and sentence of the law. In written laws, men use to make a difference between the letter and the sentence of the law. And when by the letter is meant whatsoever can be gathered from the bare words, tis well distinguished. For the significations of almost all words are either in themselves or in the metaphorical use of them, ambiguous and may be drawn in argument to make many senses. But there is only one sense of the law. But if by the letter be meant the leader all sense, then the letter and the sentence or intention of the law is all one. For the leader all sense is that which the legislator is always supposed to be equity, for it were a great contumely for a judge to think otherwise of the sovereign. He ought therefore, if the word of the law do not fully authorize a reasonable sentence, 
to supply it with the law of nature. Or if the case be difficult, to respite judgment till he have received more ample authority. For example, a written law ordaineth that he which is thrust out of his house by force shall be restored by force. It happens that a man by negligence leaves his house empty and returning is kept out by force, in which case there is no special law ordained. It is evident that this case is contained in the same law, for else there is no remedy for him at all, which is to be supposed against the intention of the legislator. Again, the word of the law, common death to judge according to the evidence, a man is accused foulsly of a fact, which the judge saw himself done by another, and not by him that is accused. In this case neither shall the letter of the law be followed to the condemnation of the innocent, nor shall the judge give sentence against the evidence of the witnesses. Because the letter of the law is to the contrary, but procure of the sovereign that another be made judge, and himself witness. So that the incommodity that follows the bare words of a written law, may lead him to the intention of the law, whereby to interpret the same the better. Though no incommodity can warrant a sentence against the law. For every judge of right, and wrong is not judge of what is commodious or incommodious to the commonwealth. The abilities required in a judge. The abilities required in a good interpreter of the law, that is to say, in a good judge, are not the same with those of an advocate, namely the study of the laws. For a judge, as he ought to take notice of the fact, from none but the witnesses. So also he ought to take notice of the law, from nothing but the statutes and constitutions of the sovereign, all edged in the pleading or declared to him by some that have authority from the sovereign power to declare them, and need not take care beforehand, what he shall judge. For it shall be given him what he shall say concerning the fact, by witnesses. And what he shall say in point of law, from those that shall in their pleading shew it, and by authority interpret it upon the place. The lords of parliament in England were judges, and most difficult causes have been heard and determined by them. Yet few of them were much versed in the study of the laws, and fewer had made profession of them, and though they consulted with lawyers that were appointed to be present there for that purpose, yet they alone had the authority of giving sentence. In like manner, in the ordinary trials of right, twelve men of the common people are the judges and give sentence not only of the fact, but of the right, and pronounce simply for the complainant or for the defendant. That is to say, our judges not only of the fact, but also of the right, and in a question of crime, not only determine whether done or not done, but also whether it be murder, homicide, felony, assault, and the like, which are determinations of law. But because they are not supposed to know the law of themselves, there is one that hath authority to inform them of it, in the particular case they are to judge of. But yet if they judge not according to that he tells them, they are not subject thereby to any penalty. Unless it be made appear, they did it against their consciences, or had been corrupted by reward. The things that make a good judge, or good interpreter of the laws, are, first a right understanding of that principal law of nature called equity, which depending not on the reading of other men's writings, but on the goodness of a man's own natural reason, and meditation, is presumed to be in those most, that have had most leisure, and had the most inclination to meditate thereon. Secondly, contempt of unnecessary riches and preferments. Thirdly, to be able in judgment to devast himself of all fear, anger, hatred, love, and compassion. Fourthly, and lastly, patience to hear, diligent attention in hearing, and memory to retain, digest, and apply what he hath heard. Divisions of law. The difference and division of the laws has been made in divers manners, according to the different methods of those men that have written of them. For it is a thing that dependeth not on nature, but on the scope of the writer, and is subservient to every man's proper method. In the institutions of Justinian, we find seven sorts of civil laws. 1. The edicts, constitutions, and epistles of the prince, that is, of the emperor, because the whole power of the people was in him. Like these, are the proclamations of the kings of England. 2. The decrees of the whole people of Rome, comprehending the senate, when they were put to the question by the senate. These were laws, at first, by the virtue of the sovereign power residing in the people, and such of them as by the emperors were not abrogated, remained laws by the authority imperial. For all laws that bind, are understood to be laws by his authority that has power to repeal them. Somewhat like to these laws, are the acts of parliament in England. 3. 
The decrees of the common people, excluding the Senate, when they were put to the question by the tribune of the people. For such of them as were not abrogated by the emperors, remained laws by the authority imperial. Like to these were the orders of the House of Commons in England. For, Senatus consulta, the orders of the Senate, because when the people of Rome grew so numerous, as it was inconvenient to assemble them. It was thought fit by the emperor, that men should consult the Senate instead of the people, and these have some resemblance with the acts of council. 5. The edicts of praetors, and, in some cases, of the aediles, such as are the chief justices in the courts of England. 6. Responsa prudentum, which were the sentences and opinions of those lawyers, to whom the emperor gave authority to interpret the law, and to give answer to such as in matter of law demanded their advice. Which answers, the judges in giving judgment were obliged by the constitutions of the emperor to observe and should be like the reports of cases judged, if other judges be by the law of England bound to observe them. For the judges of the common law of England are not properly judges, but juris consulti, of whom the judges, who were either the lords or twelve men of the country, are in point of law to ask advice. 7. Also, unwritten customs, which in their own nature are an imitation of law, by the tacite consent of the emperor, in case they be not contrary to the law of nature, are very laws. Another division of laws is into natural and positive. Natural are those which have been laws from all eternity, and are called not only natural, but also moral laws. Consisting in the moral virtues as justice, equity, and all habits of the mind that conduce to peace and charity, of which I have already spoken in the 14th and 15th chapters. Positive are those which have not been for eternity but have been made laws by the will of those that have had the sovereign power over others, and are either written or made known to men by some other argument of the will of their legislator. Another division of law. Again, of positive laws some are humane, some divine, and of humane positive laws some are distributive, some penal. Distributive are those that determine the rights of the subjects, declaring to every man what it is, by which he acquireth and holdeth the propriety in lands, or goods, and a right or liberty of actions. And these speak to all the subjects. Penal are those, which declare, what penalty shall be inflicted on those that violate the law, and speak to the ministers and officers ordained for execution. For though every one ought to be informed of the punishments ordained beforehand for their transgression, nevertheless the command is not addressed to the delinquent, who cannot be supposed will faithfully punish himself, but to public ministers appointed to see the penalty executed. And these penal laws are for the most part written together with the laws distributive, and are sometimes called judgments. For all laws are general judgments, or sentences of the legislator, as also every particular judgment is a law to him, whose case is judged. Divine positive law how made known to be law. Divine positive laws, for natural laws being eternal and universal, are all divine, are those, which being the commandments of God, not from all eternity nor universally addressed to all men, but only to a certain people or to certain persons, are declared for such, by those whom God hath authorized to declare them. But this authority of man to declare what be these positive laws of God, how can it be known? God may command a man by a supernatural way to deliver laws to other men. But because it is of the essence of law, that he who is to be obliged be assured of the authority of him that declareth it, which we cannot naturally take notice to be from God. How can a man without supernatural revelation be assured of the revelation received by the declarer? And how can he be bound to obey them? For the first question, how a man can be assured of the revelation of another, without a revelation particularly to himself, it is evidently impossible. For though a man may be induced to believe such revelation, from the miracles they see him do, or from seeing the extraordinary sanctity of his life, or from seeing the extraordinary wisdom, or extraordinary felicity of his actions, all which are marks of God's extraordinary favor, yet they are not assured evidence of special revelation. Miracles are marvelous works, but that which is marvelous to one may not be so to another. Sanctity may be feigned, and the visible felicities of this world are most often the work of God by natural and ordinary causes. And therefore no man can infallibly know by natural reason that another has had a supernatural revelation of God's will but only a belief. Every one, as the signs thereof shall appear greater or lesser, a firmer or a weaker belief. But for the second, 
how he can be bound to obey them, it is not so hard. For if the law declared, be not against the law of nature, which is undoubtedly God's law, and he undertake to obey it, he is bound by his own act. Bound I say to obey it, but not bound to believe it, for men's belief and interior cogitations are not subject to the commands, but only to the operation of God, ordinary or extraordinary. Faith of supernatural law is not a fulfilling, but only an assenting to the same, and not a duty that we exhibit to God, but a gift which God freely giveth to whom he pleaseth. As also unbelief is not a breach of any of his laws, but a rejection of them all, except the laws natural. But this that I say will be made yet clearer by the examples and testimonies concerning this point in Holy Scripture. The covenant God made with Abraham in a supernatural manner was thus, Jen. 17, 10. This is the covenant which thou shalt observe between me and thee, and thy seed after thee. Abraham's seed had not this revelation, nor were yet in being. Yet they are a party to the covenant, and bound to obey what Abraham should declare to them for God's law, which they could not be, but in virtue of the obedience they owed to their parents. Who, if they be subject to no other earthly power, as here in the case of Abraham, have sovereign power over their children and servants. Again, where God saith to Abraham, and thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. For I know thou wilt command thy children, and thy house after thee to keep the way of the Lord, and to observe righteousness and judgment, it is manifest, the obedience of his family. Who had no revelation, depended on their former obligation to obey their sovereign. At Mount Sinai Moses only went up to God, the people were forbidden to approach on pain of death, yet were they bound to obey all that Moses declared to them for God's law. Upon what ground, but on this submission of their own, speak thou to us, and we will hear thee. But let not God speak to us, lest we die, by which two places it sufficiently appeareth that in a commonwealth, a subject that has no certain and assured revelation particularly to himself concerning the will of God, is to obey for such the command of the commonwealth. For if men were at liberty to take for God's commandments their own dreams and fancies, or the dreams and fancies of private men, scarce two men would agree upon what is God's commandment. And yet in respect of them, every man would despise the commandments of the commonwealth. I conclude, therefore, that in all things not contrary to the moral law, that is to say, to the law of nature, all subjects are bound to obey that for divine law, which is declared to be so. By the laws of the commonwealth, which also is evident to any man's reason, for whatsoever is not against the law of nature, may be made law in the name of them that have the sovereign power. And there is no reason men should be the less obliged by it, when tis propounded in the name of God. Besides, there is no place in the world where men are permitted to pretend other commandments of God than are declared for such by the commonwealth. Christian states punish those that revolt from Christian religion, and all other states, those that set up any religion by them forbidden. For in whatsoever is not regulated by the commonwealth, tis equity, which is the law of nature, and therefore an eternal law of God, that every man equally enjoy his liberty. Another division of laws. There is also another distinction of laws, into fundamental and not fundamental, but I could never see in any author what a fundamental law signifieth. Nevertheless, one may very reasonably distinguish laws in that manner. A fundamental law what? For a fundamental law in every commonwealth is that, which being taken away, the commonwealth faileth, and is utterly dissolved, as a building whose foundation is destroyed. And therefore a fundamental law is that, by which subjects are bound to uphold whatsoever power is given to the sovereign, whether a monarch or a sovereign assembly, without which the commonwealth cannot stand, such as is the power of war and peace, of judicature, of election of officers, and of doing whatsoever he shall think necessary for the public good. Not fundamental is that the abrogating whereof draweth not with it the dissolution of the commonwealth, such as are the laws concerning controversies between subject and subject. Thus much of the division of laws. Difference between law and right. I find the words lex civilis and just civil, that is to say, law and right civil, promiscuously used for the same thing, even in the most learned authors, which nevertheless ought not to be so. For right is liberty, namely that liberty which the civil law leaves us. But civil law is an obligation, and takes from us the liberty which the law of nature gave us. Nature gave a right to every man to secure himself by his own strength, 
and to invade a suspected neighbor by way of prevention. But the civil law takes away that liberty in all cases where the protection of the law may be safely stayed for. Insomuch as lex and jus are as different as obligation and liberty. In between a law and a charter. Likewise, laws and charters are taken promiscuously for the same thing. Yet charters are donations of the sovereign, and not laws, but exemptions from law. The phrase of a law is jubio, injungo, I command, and enjoin. The phrase of a charter is dedi, concessi, I have given, I have granted. But what is given or granted to a man is not forced upon him by a law. A law may be made to bind all the subjects of a commonwealth, a liberty, or charter is only to one man, or some one part of the people. For to say all the people of a commonwealth have liberty in any case whatsoever, is to say that in such case there hath been no law made, or else having been made, is now abrogated. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.